Hello everyone. Um, it's good to see you all virtually again. Um, I'm so glad you could join me virtually and I'm recording um, the Founders Hall Sunday School class uh, from my home again. So we're gathering at church this week, which is uh, February 7th, tomorrow. Um, but we know that some of you can't, um, I won't be able to attend in person. So, so we're recording um, this video to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to be able to gather with you. Um, as well. So we normally start with prayer and praise requests. So I was hoping that each one of you or as you're watching this, that you can just take a few seconds right now and think about those prayer requests and those praise reports that you might have. And even though I, I can't hear them, um, I can come in agreement and pray through faith for your requests. So, so we'll do that now. So, so let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing and abundant mercy, grace, and love. Thank you for the blessings you pour out on us this week. Thank you for hearing our prayers and providing the blessing of patience and kindness, gentleness, health, provision for our families, our friends, neighbors, even for those that we don't know but that we're praying for. We worship and praise you, Father, for you are worthy, worthy, worthy. Father, we believe in your faithfulness. We may have even seen it this past week. We're encouraged that you're present in our lives. We come to you, Father, with prayers for our circumstances and those of our family, our friends and our community, our church and the church universal. We lift up our prayers to you, Father, being faith-filled, faith-filled that you are doing a new thing and that you hear our prayers. Father, I want to thank you and please remind us that you hold us, that you hold us in your right hand, that no matter what happens, we can run to you. You are our strong tower. We can run to you, Father. And for those who don't understand that, Father, I pray that through their circumstance and through the peace and comfort that you will bring to them through the Holy Spirit, that they will come to realize the love that you have for them and that they too are held and can run to you because you are their strong tower. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Um, so um, the sermon series that Pastor Aaron and the, and the leadership team are doing um, is around the Apostles' Creed. So hopefully, hopefully you've been watching that and hopefully you got a bookmark. Um, so we sent bookmarks out, the office sent them out um, to everyone. And so if you didn't get one, let me know, call the office, we'll get one to you. Um, but let's go ahead and read the Apostles' Creed. I, I don't know if you watched the service, you might have done that, but, but maybe you haven't watched the service. So, so let's read the Apostles' Creed and let's reaffirm our faith um, and our beliefs. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who, has con our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay, let's get started on our lesson. So we're on lesson session 10 of unit two, and um, that unit is called Who is Jesus? The Gospel of Mark. So we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. Um, last week, Danny uh, did, uh, um, I forget which one he did, but he, he did the, the session nine before this one. The title of this session is The Lord of the Dispossessed. So feeling dispossessed is this feeling of left out or isolated, not part of the community. Um, sometimes people feel like they, they don't belong and it, it could be for a lot of reasons, but you know, based on their race, their age, maybe physical challenges they have, 
a status of some sort, um, you know, a nationality or, or even their gender. So, but what this lesson is telling us, my friends, is that God's mercy and grace extend to everyone, regardless of the, the factors that they may feel dispossess them. So if you're, if you're, um, if you're not forgot you, so you're not forgotten or left out of the kingdom. No one is. And our study, so our study is Mark uh, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. It's going to help us understand that. Um, so if you get a second, get your Bible, open it up. Again, Mark, Mark chapter 7, verses 25 through 37. I'm going to read verses 24 through 30. It's Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman is um, the title of the, that, that part of the scripture. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it, if, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Of course, of course, the demon was gone. Okay, so there's a something in the middle of this passage that I know raises questions for some of you, um, specifically how Jesus first responds to the woman. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, where he says, um, uh, where he talks about um, that, that the children should eat first before the dogs. So implying that she's a dog. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but there are so many points in, in this event in this thing that happened, that focusing on that first response that Jesus has misses the point. So remember the parables we discussed a couple of classes ago, we talked about how the, those parables have so many aspects. And when seen from a different angle or considered within the context of the other parables in the, um, in the, in the chapter or, you know, in the book that we're reading, that that context gives us even more insight, right? And it's the same here with this event. So before we dive in, let's take a look at the context and see what's going on. So um, first, this event is told not just by Mark, but also by Matthew, and it's in Matthew chapter 15. So um, as you remember, Mark is really like this quick gospel. It's, you know, not a lot of detail, but boy, do we go through it quickly and we get to a lot of events in a short amount of time. So um, he provides, you know, um, a lot of events, but generally a little bit less detail. So, so sometimes when I talk about this um, passage, I'll be actually referring to, to Matthew as well. So if you get a chance, go back and read it in Matthew 15. There's more detail about kind of what happens there. Um, so, so what's happened in the book of Mark um, is a lot of things. So um, up to this point. So um if we just go back quickly, uh, you know, at a prior few chapters in Mark, it reveals what's going on. So, so Jesus has been baptized. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago by John the Baptist. He's been tempted by the enemy for 40 days in the wilderness. He selected his disciples. He's cast out demons. He healed Peter's mother and many, many others that, that day came to Peter's house and they were healed. Um, he healed a leper and a paralytic. Um, all the while being followed, literally followed <laughs> and questioned, kind of spied on by the Pharisees who were trying to trap him in any of his words and any of his deeds that he was doing. You know, the Pharisees were, why do you heal on Sunday? Why do you eat with sinners and the unclean? These were the things he was dealing with, um, from the Pharisees. He, he told, he told many parables about the kingdom and the truth. And, and we, we studied some of those already. He walked on water and saved Peter and calmed the sea. <laughs> um, he, he drove out the legion, the legion of demons. So this was not one demon, but multiple demons, um, 
who, who were actually afraid of him, <laughs> afraid of Jesus. So, um, so he did that. And the crowds, the crowds around him were very large, very, very large. And they pressed in on him. They wanted to get close to him. They wanted to know him. They wanted to see him. Think about it as a, a movie star or, a, you know, a, um, a, you know, a, a you know, somebody famous and and they appear somewhere and everybody crowds around right um and all he had was the disciples he didn't have a bunch of bodyguards so they all got pretty close to him and um we remember the one story where the crowds are pressing on him and um the woman with the blood reaches out and touches just his garment and he does it he turns around he knows you know the spirit has has um has been imparted been imparted to the woman and and he says um you know well, who did that and and the disciples are like are you serious there's like so many people touching you we don't know who it was of course jesus did but but anyway that's that's the kind of people throngs of people that were around him so and um and and he went to he's gone he's also in those those chapters gone to nazareth and was rejected by his own people right not just rejected in Luke, it tells us that they were going to throw Jesus off this hill. I don't know there was a cliff, but a hill. So, um, so that's pretty traumatic and stressful. And then there was um, the murder of John the Baptist. You know, they, he was killed, um, beheaded. Uh, so, wow, that's a lot. Um, and the feeding of the 5,000, you remember that, right? You remember that event. Jesus fed the multitudes of people with two loaves and five fish. And amazingly, everyone was blessed. Everyone was so blessed that they were eat, they ate until they were full, right? And, and the amazing thing was there were still leftovers, probably like little pieces of food on the ground, um, maybe under a blanket that they'd been sitting on, right? That had kind of been discarded or just dropped as they were eating. Um, but there was a lot there, a lot. Um, so you remember that story. And all throughout this time, he continues to deal with the resistance from the Pharisees. There's the, the, their most recent criticism was, why don't you wash your hands before you eat? So this is the, the story right before we, we um, get into the scripture we're studying. So Jesus explains, right, uh, to the Pharisees that a person and... You should read that as well, right? But a person is not defiled by what they eat. Defilement doesn't come from outside. Defilement comes from within. He explains that it's a condition of the heart that defiles us, not food. Um, so they, so that that whole passage is about um, the Pharisees think, saying that you know there's certain foods or things that are unclean and. Um, and they'll defile you if they're unclean. They had the, the, the Pharisees had a lot of rules um, about um, un uncleanliness and being defiled. And, you know, what happened if you became unclean? If you touched a dead body, how long did you have to do whatever it was you had to do to, to, to be, be cleansed again? You know, those sorts of things. There was a lot about how they were going to become unclean and defiled from things they, they did or happened to them in, in the world. And, and, and Jesus was explaining, no, that is not it. That's not it at all. That it's, um, it comes from your heart. So that has just happened. And um, after all of that, right, he leaves the borders of ancient Israel. So the borders of, um, you know, the Jewish state, so to speak, right? Um, and this is like the first time, or I think the only time we see Jesus leave um, Israel. Uh, and he walks, it's like 20 to 40 miles in there to, to Tyre. And Tyre is north um, of the this, of this Sea of Galilee and a little bit west. And it's right on um, the Mediterranean um, shore. And, um, and it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's in present day Lebanon. So, so it was up there. And it was a city of Gentiles, not just Gentiles, like idolaters. They worshipped other gods. They they did all the things that we read about, right? In in these uh, these these um, 
countries that, that were pagan countries, right? And Tyre, this is not the first time Tyre appears in the Bible. It, it, it's in the Bible numerous places. It's, it's go to Ezekiel 26, 27, and 28, three chapters. <laughs> <laughs> and Ezekiel and his prophecies um, and his lamenta lamentations about um, Tyre. So, um, so it's a horrible place, and um, it, everyone there, you know, would would have been considered totally unclean. I mean, talk about unclean, right? Um, by the Jews, um, and and you know, for their behaviors and, and their pagan behaviors and. And they were just really, truly an enemy of, um, of the Jews. Um, so even Jesus uses Tyre prior to going there as an example to denounce, interesting enough, Jewish towns, right? People in Jewish towns because they did not repent after seeing his miracles. That's in Matthew, 10, or Matthew 11, 20 through 24. So um, the people of Tyre were bad, sinful, unrepentant, unclean, filthy enemies of the Jews, and they deserved no mercy from God. And they could expect to receive judgment and no redemption. I, you know, that's what that that's just the way it was. He had no covenant covenant with them, right? He had no covenant with them, as he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their families. So there, there's no expectation of um, any sort of mercy, and they shouldn't have it. So the Bible doesn't tell us why Jesus goes to Tyre. He didn't go there to preach to the Gentiles. Um, he, was sent, he was sent by God um, to preach to God's chosen children, the, the Jews. Um, Paul tells us that, right? Paul says first, uh, Jews first, and then the Gentiles. Um, so that wasn't the purpose that he went there. Uh, scholars think that he went there because he, to get some rest, kind of the way the Gospels are written uh, in Mark and, and Matthew, um, that he went to get rest. So he'd been around all these people, all these throngs. John had been murdered. Um, people were not understanding him. Um, he was, you know, really try, trying to, to preach the truth, uh, the way and the life to them. And, and they just weren't getting it. And so... Um, so they think maybe he traveled this far away, right, to rest. Um, and the scripture says that we read, he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. So he sounded like he didn't want people to know. So he went a, he went really far away to a different place where there's no Jews, right? <laughs> right? And thought he could get some rest. But, but remember just two weeks ago, um, on our last study, um, we studied a parable, and that parable was about a lamp to be set on a stand because all that is hidden must uh, was meant to be disclosed. Do, do you remember that parable that we studied? So Jesus can't be hidden. He's the light. He's meant to be disclosed. So disclosed he was, even as far off as Tyre um, of the Gentile idol, you know, a, a city of Gentile idolaters. So, um, so anyway, there he is, you know, not anonymous. <laughs> People recognize him, right? And this woman was familiar with Jesus's reputation, obviously, right? So word travels fast, so to speak. The word travels, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the, the scripture says, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, meaning that she heard that he was in town, right? A woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit, um, came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenician. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. So this woman was a Gentile. She lived in Tyre. Um, one of those from this amazingly unclean city, but she had heard about Jesus and his miracles. And, and, and not only in, in Matthew, she, when she comes to, to Jesus, she calls him the son of David. Um, so, so that's, I mean, that's not something people would generally know, right? I mean, that's, that is really, um, 
uh, Jewish scripture, right? That, that the Messiah would come from the seed of David and that um, people were saying that Jesus was the son of David. And of course he was the son of David. So the fact that she knew this um, is interesting. It's interesting. She, she knew quite a bit um, and had heard quite a bit about Jesus. Um, so she'd probably heard about his miracles. We don't know which ones um, she'd heard about, but we do know that she probably um, hadn't seen one but she'd heard of them. She, she probably never seen a miracle like people in Israel, um, like the Jewish community that Jesus was preaching to, they saw the miracles. Um, and, you, and you'll recall that, that, that Jesus had said um, that he had used Tyre as an example to say, look, you're, you're as bad as Tyre, right? He called out cities that were not repenting after they'd seen his miracle. And this woman hadn't seen probably any miracles. She'd probably just heard about him. So, and can, can, can you imagine, I can, that this is her daughter um, who's very, very ill. Um, and she ran, I can imagine when she heard that she ran that, that she ran, she dropped everything that she was doing, maybe pots and pans, you know, maybe brooms, um, maybe vegetables. I don't know what she had in her hands, but she would have dropped them and she was running to where he was. So she ran full of hope. She's running in hope that Jesus can do something um, if she could just get to him. And when she gets there, it says she falls down at his feet. Well, okay, so what does that mean? Visualize that. So she's running, she's dropped everything, things are scattered, she's running and she falls. She she probably skids down on her knees and from her knees then she's probably bent down at the waist with her face in the dirt and the dust and maybe even dung with her hands out in front of Jesus, humbly worshiping him. So then she begins, it says, to beg him. So Mark doesn't say she asked him. She didn't ask him. He says she begged him. So begging usually happens after you've asked and nothing's happened, right? right? So your kids start begging you after they've asked one time and you haven't done anything. Maybe you've ignored them. And in Matthew, that's what it says, that Jesus basically ignored her. Um, he didn't, didn't speak to her. He didn't, you know, um, rec recognize her, that she was there. And the disciples had eventually said to Jesus, can you just do something? Because she's really bothersome. Kind of brings back that story of the, the unjust um, judge and the woman who kept... Um, persistently um, begging him for his uh, for his judgment to, uh, and so um, so so she's begging him just begging him probably crying on her hands and knees dirt on her face right this is her daughter and she's heard about Jesus she's heard what he can do so she, um, so she's responding to Jesus very humbly, right? Very humbly. And Jesus tells her it, he isn't there for her, but for the children of God. He was there to feed God's children the light and the truth, not the Gentiles. And she responded to Jesus humbly again. She knows her place. She, she knows her place. Um, she knows she's not chosen. She's not yet grafted into the vine. She knows she has no, there's no covenant with her or her people and God. She knows she doesn't deserve anything from him, but judgment and condemnation. Even so, she doesn't give up. She doesn't give up. Maybe she's heard of the feeding of the 5,000. Maybe she heard that the blessings given to those 5,000 were so abundant that there was more than they could ever receive. 
that there were scraps left, scraps left over, maybe no bigger than a crumb. And she believed by faith that that smallest crumb tossed aside was big enough to bless her and her daughter. So she says, Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Jesus says, for that reply, the word there, reply, the Greek would have been logos. Little L, logos. And logos means principle. And principle is for that principle or for that fundamental truth. That's what that means there, literally. For that fundamental truth, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So here's this woman, right? Jesus has just come from his own people, even in Nazareth and broader than that, right? Capernaum, the Galilee, um, Jerusalem, those places, right? Um, and there was so much unbelief in him and so much uncleanliness in those people in his own homeland. It was probably tired and weary and he encounters this, this Gentile woman with no background, no understanding of God or God's plan like the Jews had. The, the, the Jews knew the law and the prophets. They knew the Messiah was coming. They, they knew what God's plan was to redeem them. Um, and through that redemption, you know, save all nations, right? Um, so unlike the Pharisees, but unlike the Pharisees who, who didn't get that, who, who were prideful, who um, were not open, uh, who were closed off, who were combative and, and unbelieving. She knew exactly where she stood. She knew. She understood her status. And she humbly accepted that she was dispossessed. But she understood that Jesus was generous and merciful. So she per persisted in faith, in faith. Asking for the least, the very least, just a crumb, just a crumb. And Jesus obliged. She ran home, probably back the same path she was on. Probably running now with expectation and with joy and faith filled that when she got there, she would see her daughter. And she did, and there was no demon. And it was just that crumb was all she needed. So, folks, if you feel like you don't belong, or if you know someone who feels like they don't belong, based on their race, or their age, or, or physical challenges they may have, or or their status, or, or their nationality, where they come from. Their status of, of being a foreigner, their gender. Be encouraged and encourage them. Encourage them that this story, my friends, of this woman and the mercy and grace Jesus extends to everyone who believes, regardless of who she was, her race, her gender, or nationality, or anything else. Jesus is the Lord of the dispossessed and invites us all to the feast that he's preparing for us in heaven. So we can be thankful for that. So let's close in prayer. Father, we are thankful for Jesus. We are thankful for his kindness and his mercy. We are thankful that as we believe in him and have faith in him, he will be faithful. He is unchanging and immutable. He is the Lord of the dispossessed, 
because we are never dispossessed in the kingdom. The king invites us in and through faith we are accepted as one of his grafted to the vine. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, everyone. I hope I see you soon um, in church. Please uh, be safe and be careful and know that I'm praying for each one of you and I miss you. Bye-bye.